Hey folks, Annie from Mountain Crest Gardens here, and today is a very good day because we get to talk about air plants. These are also known as Tillandsias, and they're just these incredibly unique sculptural beauties. They really occupy the space between botany and art. So we're gonna go over how you can create some cool displays like this, as well as a bit of the botany behind them and how to care for them at home really easily. So let's get into it. Air plants don't need soil to grow, and that opens up a lot of options when we're looking at how to display them. So one of the easiest ways to go is to really just lay them on things around the house. You wanna make sure you're using a material that's not gonna hold on to water, nothing spongy. But some great options are wood, like we've got a, a grape wood trunk here, a piece of ghost wood. They both make really nice backdrops for your air plants. But you could do anything like rock, some little gravel, crushed glass like this one here, or even some sand or shells look really nice as well. The next option is to attach your air plants to things. Take it up a level, so to speak. And this one right here is done pretty simply with a piece of wire, and that's a great way of doing it. I also really like to use fishing line like that to create sort of that invisible attachment to make it look like it's floating. And you can use other adhesives like hot glue or tilly tacker. You just wanna keep the temperature low and know that then it's a really permanent display. And the third method that I really like over here is just to kind of tuck my air pl plants into little things. So the choya wood is a good example. It's got all these big holes in it and you can really nestle an air plant into any of those and it looks great. But additionally, if you have vases or pots or even glassware around the house, you can stick some air plants into them. And glass is a great option because Tillandsias are actually one of those plants that can grow in an open terrarium like this. But really, nestle them anywhere you want. It could be in a basket, in some gift wrapping, in your hair. The options are endless. Air plants are all native to warm climates throughout the Americas, and they come from all the way in Florida's Everglades down to the subtropics of South America. Tillandsias vary a lot in terms of their form, and they also come in a lot of different sizes, as you can see from this little tiny guy here versus something like our big mama air plant. But all of them are what's called epiphytes, and all that means is that they grow off the ground. So they're growing attached to things like trees, other plants, even inanimate objects. And they're able to do this with these little structures here. And it looks like the root of the plant, but really it's just helping to anchor that plant in place onto the tree or whatever it's attached to. And this isn't a parasite, so it's not sucking any energy from its host plant with that. It's just holding it in place to go for, you know, the best habitat with lots of sunshine, lots of airflow, and plenty of water. Something you will see in a lot of them is a shape like this, this kind of funnel shape. And that's really good to help the plant collect and store water. But aside from that, there's a whole lot of diversity out there. So I picked out some of my favorite quirky examples. You've got things like this that are really straight and grass-like versus our Xerographica over here, which has really curly leaves. Or you may be familiar with Spanish moss, also an air plant, but with really thin leaves and prolific, just gorgeous clumping growth. And then we've got our stems over here. So some of them can grow a longer stem, this kind of curving diaguitensis, but then others have a really short kind of bulbous form to them. Without traditional roots growing into the soil, a Tillandsia actually depends on its leaves for all the things that a plant needs to live. And they do this with these little structures that are kind of like leaf scales or a little hair. It's called a trichome and it lets the leaf absorb water, either from rain or humidity, and they can even take in nutrients that way. And they give the air plants, a lot of them have this kind of silvery look to them, and some of them feel a little bit velvety, and then in really extreme examples, they look really feathery. Air plants fall into two pretty distinct categories, depending on if they come from a really humid climate or more of a dry climate. And they're pretty easy to tell apart. They look really distinctive. So we'll start with this one right here. This is Tillandsia bootsii, or as I like to call it, buttsii. And I can tell that this is what's called a mesic variety, meaning it comes from a humid climate. And that's just because it's really smooth and green. It doesn't have a lot of those silvery, velvety coverings. So I know that this plant is gonna be able to tolerate a little bit lower light, but it likes more frequent water. And on the other hand, if I pull something like Tillandsia tectorum over here, it's got a lot of those silvery, feathery trichomes on it. So I know then that this is a, what's called a xeric variety. It's from a dry climate. 
and it's gonna like a lot of sunshine, but a little bit less water. Air plants can show some pretty fun colors as well. A number of the ones that we carry are listed as enhanced, and that just means that they have a plant safe dye on them to give them some pretty cool colors. But there are others that also do this naturally, like this one right here, Tillandsia lautneri. It's been getting direct sun, and so it's flushing with pigment. You can see a lot of cool burgundies and coppery tones going on in there. Tillandsias have very showy blooms. They're what's known as monocarpic, meaning they'll only flower once in their lifetime, but it usually takes years for that to happen. When they do flower, they can vary in size, but they tend to look really tropical. A lot of them have these multicolored blooms, and some of them even are fragrant. Now, that flower is gonna last for over a month, after which it'll dry out a lot like this big old bloom stalk here, at which point, it's really simple. You can snip them off without harming the mother plant. After flowering, an air plant can start to produce new offsets or pups, kind of the next generation. And these pups usually appear around the base of a mother plant, just like this. And it's sort of a common misconception that an air plant blooms and then instantly dies, when in fact, these pups take a while to grow and you're gonna have the mother plant for some time to come. Now, you can either leave the new pups to be and they will kind of form this clump or cluster over time, or if you do want to separate them, I would wait until the pup is about a third the size of the mother plant and it feels like it can just gently be pulled apart like this. Air plants are incredibly easy plants to care for, even if you're a beginner. And one of the reasons for that is, is that they're just very slow growing. So they're also really slow to react to changes as you're figuring out your care strategy. So for care, let's start with light. These buddies are going to like as much bright, but indirect kind of diffuse light as they can get. So really most rooms with a sunny window are just perfect for them. They can also take a bit of direct sun a couple hours a day, just so long as they're being well hydrated. Now personally, I really like to move my air plants around the house periodically, and that allows me to keep them in rooms like a bathroom, say, that doesn't have maybe as much light, as long as then I move it and balance it out in a sunnier room later. When it comes to water, this is one of the few times that you'll hear me break the golden rule of succulents and say that I support frequent watering. Air plants really like a lot of water, and there's three pretty simple ways to water them, and regardless of which one you pick, you're gonna wanna use some cool tap water. So strategy number one is the daily misting strategy. So for this one, I'll pick this guy here. I'm gonna pretty thoroughly mist my air plant. And you can see I'm getting to all sides of it, even the bottom, and I wanna give it a pretty good drenching. So this is a really good option for the doting plant parent who really wants to connect with their Tillandsia every day. Strategy number two though is the dunking method. We'll go for you for this one. So for the dunking method, the plant needs to be fully submerged under water or passed under running water like in a sink. And I wanna make sure all the bits are staying under. And when I take it out, just be sure to shake off any excess droplets. So that process you wanna do about two to four times a week. Strategy number three is the once a week super soaker method. And it's my favorite, I think it's also the most popular method. For this one, we wanna completely submerge again, but we're gonna soak this baby for one to two hours. So you may find you need like a wooden spoon or something to keep it from floating back up. And after the one to two hours, same thing, I wanna take it out and shake off any excess droplets. Because you can't really water an air plant too frequently, but you can get these little spots of mold if you don't shake off droplets, or if you try to keep it on something spongy like moss. You will see signs that your air plant is thirsty though. So there's two ways that they do this. One, like this one right here, it's starting to fold its leaves in on itself, and that kind of channeling means it's starting to get thirsty. The other thing that happens is as a plant dries, it can start curling its leaves. So this one's a good example here. These two are the same species, but this plant has been watered more recently and its leaves are a lot straighter. Whereas the leaves of this curly guy, it's ready for a drink real soon. Another reason that these are such easy plants to grow indoors is that they're rarely affected by pests. And that's especially true if you're using the one hour soak method to water and you always shake off any excess droplets. But if you do find any bugs, let's say a mealybug, you can go ahead and give it another one hour soak to help wash away any pests and then give the whole plant a really thorough spraying of isopropyl alcohol. 
For fertilizer, Tillandsias aren't really heavy feeders, but if you're growing them at home, they really do rely on you for all of their nutrients and minerals. So there's a number of different fertilizers you can use. I'm really a big fan of this air plant food, which you can find on our website, because it's heavy metal free and it's already mixed at the right NPK ratio. So you don't have to do any math, there's no dilutions going on. All you gotta do is really thoroughly spray your whole plant, so get on all sides of it. And you can do this anywhere from once a week all the way up to once a month. Tillandsias are not frost hardy. They really just like nice temperate climates. So you could keep it outdoors in the shade if temperatures are between say 40 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or you could just bring it inside, set the thermostat to whatever you feel comfortable at, and your little buddy here is gonna be perfectly content. These gorgeous little beauties are so fun and easy to grow, and they really give you a lot of room to use your creativity as you think about how you wanna display them. So I'd love to see what you come up with. Feel free to share a photo either through our website, mountaincrestgardens.com, or on Instagram with the hashtag MCGStyle. And until next time, happy succulenting.